left. Crowd standing up. A lot of people here. It's a sellout crowd. Santa Yanez. Final round. Watch your head. Come on, come on. Head goes orthodox. Trying to unzip Elder. Find those openings. Set round seven, eight, nine. I thought Burton was slowing down. He really came on. I thought he took the last two. And it's a good thing that the way in. Oh, Elder with the left hand. And Burton is in big trouble. Holding on for his life here. Stevie's not going to make it. There goes the left. Ebo Elder. Speed, it looks like, Steve. Out on his feet. He barely lifted his leg when the referee asked him, if you got to stop it, there's the left. An unbelievable, stunning turn of events. Reversal of fortune. Courtney Burton is flat on his back. Blood streaming from the right eye as we look in. Victorious, Ebo Elder. Yeah, I think you know what? Ebo Elder right now is praying to God, and that's fine, but he should also be praying for his opponent. That left hand by Ebo Elder, again and again and again. Wow, what a finish. Elder was headed for victory on the cards. Lord, I thank you for this gladiator, this man with such heart, such skill, such determination. I pray that you make this this loss for him a benefit like you did for me three and a half years ago, God. Make it the best thing that ever happened to him so that he'll turn his life completely to you, God. And you understand, nothing in the natural is worth anything. Only a relationship with you, the Father, the God of the earth. That's all that matters, Lord. I pray that you touch his heart, make him have no pain, no hurt, no misunderstanding. And let him know that I love him as a brother in Christ. Yeah, in his name, amen. 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 Great fight, man. You bad oh, dude. Man, you bad dude, man. Mm -hmm. You bad. All right. Everybody. Everybody. There's a plan Jesus Christ has for your life. Yeah. Just accept it. Get him into it. Good morning, Chilling God. moment. Well, guys, uh, you know, through the years, I've had the opportunity to sign boxing gloves and sign, uh, you know, pictures um, of my fights, whatnot, and I've always liked to accompany my autograph with a Bible verse, because I know that the Word of God is life-changing. Amen? We know that. It is the Word that, that transforms us. It renews our mind. It transforms us from the inside out as the Word, as we study the Word and our faith is increased. The Word of God is life transforming. So I always like to put a verse under my, um, my autograph. And one of my favorites to use has some boxing connotation to it is Proverbs 24, 16. And I love this verse. But the first half of this verse, it, it concerns me a little bit. And I think we've got it for the screens. It says, although a righteous man falls seven times... <laughs> This, I don't like this, right? As an ex-pro boxer, the last thing I want to see happening is getting knocked down seven times. I, I don't want to get knocked down. I don't, like the, I don't like the sound of that. Although a righteous man falls seven times, you know, in boxing, we don't want to get knocked down one time, much less seven. But, you know, in, in the spiritual realm, in our spiritual realm, our walk with the Lord, we're going to get knocked down. We are. You know, Jesus was very clear. He guaranteed tribulation for his followers, didn't he? He guaranteed tribulation. He guaranteed persecution. He, gar he guaranteed hardship. And, and we get knocked down from time to time. Sometimes it's our own fault. Sometimes we make mistakes, right? Nobody claims to be perfect here, do they? <laughs> no, we make mistakes. 
Sometimes the Lord chastises. He's faithful as a good father would chastise his children. God is faithful to chastise us from time to time. Sometimes we make mistakes and we suffer the consequences of those mistakes. And sometimes we're just living in a fallen world and it's not like God intended it to be. And for, and for a season, until he makes all things new, we get knocked down from time to time. So I don't like the beginning of this ver verse very much, although it's true. You know, my 10th my, uh, grade English teacher used to say, Ebo, life's hard and then you die. <laughs> she wasn't much of an optimist. But Miss Bradbury was right. Life is hard and then you die. Now, for the believer, we have the guarantee, our, our, we are confident that when we leave these bodies, man, I, I will experience life for the very first time as God intended it. I'm looking forward to that day. Look, the day I die will be the greatest day of my life. <laughs> So we have that great confidence. But, but Miss Bradbury was right. Life is hard, and then you die. It's hard. But I love, look, and we get that in the first part of this verse. But I love the second half. <laughs> Although a righteous man falls seven times, he will get up. He will get up. As a Christ follower, Although we might get knocked down, we are never knocked out. How many of you guys have been knocked down before? <laughs> okay, I'm at the right church. Awesome. <laughs> you know, we get knocked down. We, we can all relate. You might feel like you're knocked down right now. I mean, I, I've... I've I know several people that I'm very close to just going through very difficult things, struggling with enormous challenges, and they feel like they're on the mat. Maybe you're in the same boat tonight. Maybe you feel like you're laying on the mat and you can't get up and, and, you, and you need to throw in the towel. I want you to know, I want to, I want to give you encouragement. I believe the one true and living God has a great comeback in store for you. I believe it. I believe he's got a great comeback in store for you. God is the God of the great comeback. That's, that's how he rolls. That's his style, right? The great comeback. And I believe he has one in store for you. I'm going to give you tonight, so if you have your, your notepads or your pens and pencils, I'm going to encourage you to take some notes. I'm going to give you three keys to your comeback. In this boxing match you just saw a clip of, that was... Nominated for Fight of the Year on Showtime in 2004. Uh, also, Knockout of the Year on Showtime in 2004. Um, late 2003, I wasn't boxing, and, and I wasn't saved. But God snatched me up. He pulled me out of the world. He saved me. He opened my eyes, and he called me back into boxing after a, almost a three-year hiatus. We go back into boxing. Ten months later, we get a call from Showtime. They, they say, hey, guys, you know, we know Ebo's back in boxing. We would like for him to fight on our network because he's exciting to watch. He throws lots of punches, right? And, and, and mostly because he bleeds a lot, and that's good for ratings. <laughs> so they sent us a list of potential opponents. Um, and we looked it over. And look, I knew what God had called me to do. I knew that God had called me to fight a fight that was bigger than me. He called me to fight the toughest guy in the world I could possibly get a fight with. He called me to do something bigger than me. And guys, look, I want you to know something. God has called you to a life bigger than you. He's called you to a ministry, all of you, to a ministry bigger than you. I knew what God had called me to. So we called Showtime back and said, look, guys, we don't want any of these opponents. We want you to challenge the world champion. Tell him we want to fight. <laughs> Start a fight with the world champion, right? And look, if he doesn't accept the fight with us, go to the next guy. If he doesn't do it, go to the next guy. And they, they I mean, that's a boxing producer's dream come true. So they said, okay. And they started making calls. And we hadn't quite earned a title shot yet. And the next 
two guys were only interested in fighting the champion, but they get to the number four ranked guy in the world, Courtney Burton, and he accepted the fight. Now, it was really, <laughs> it was very interesting to me when he accepted the fight because look, right after the Lord saved me, right after I knew the Lord was called me back to boxing, I watched one boxing match in 2003, and it was Courtney Burton fighting a guy named Angel Manfredi. I had never heard of Courtney, but I'd heard of Angel, and I thought Angel was going to destroy Courtney, but not at all. Courtney knocked out Angel Man Freddy, and I sat there, and I cried out to God, Lord God, when I fight again, if I ever fight again, please don't make me fight that guy. <laughs> Isn't that the character of God? <laughs> okay, give it about 13 months. Anyway, so I wasn't particularly thrilled when I got the news that Courtney Burton accepted the fight. He was the only guy in the world I was afraid to fight. And God, it's like God just said, no, yeah, that's who you're going to fight right there. And maybe you face your greatest fears at this very moment. I assure you, God is faithful. God will give you things all the time that are too great for you when you're by yourself. But he will never give you anything too great for you when you're with him. So I signed the contract to the fight. When I, signed the, when I signed the contract, I remember something happening. God gifted me with faith. He gave me faith. I knew at that moment. The Bible says faith is a gift of God, right? It's not something we work up within ourselves, the way we, we muster this determination and this faith comes out. No, this is a gift of God. And he gave me faith, imparted faith to me. And I knew from that moment on, I was going to win. Now, I had not one doubt from the moment I signed the contract to fight. Now, fast forward about two and a half months, and I go into the boxing ring, Chumash Casino, San Inez, California, live showtime boxing, 12 rounds ahead of me. I go into this fight, and very early on, I noticed something incredibly significant. I was in way over my head. <laughs> You ever been there before? I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> What'd I do? What did I do? <laughs> I've been talking about winning this fight and God's will and God's plan, and I'm about to get beat up. <laughs> no, seriously, look, I knew very early, second round-ish, I knew I was going to get beat up and probably knocked out. And it wasn't going to happen. Look, if I get beat up and knocked out in the alley behind Walmart, who cares? You wake up and go home. But this was... <laughs> But look, this was going to happen on live, worldwide boxing television. <laughs> so what did I do? I cried out to God. I said, Lord God, this fight's going to be brutal. It's going to be painful. It's going to be difficult. And I admitted my weakness. I said, Lord, I'm going to want to quit. I'm going to want to give up. I don't have, I, I'm, I'm just a little white dude that grew up on a gravel road in Palmetto, Georgia. I'm a nobody. Lord, I ain't got what it takes, and I'm going to want to quit. And God spoke back to me clearly in power and love. And he said, Ebo, if you don't quit, I'll do what you can't do. The first key to your comeback is perseverance. Perseverance. When, when the going gets tough, when, when temptation rises in your life, when, when circumstances go south, when, when things are too difficult, when it feels like you can't keep going, you don't quit. You persevere the first key to your comeback. You see, guys, when you became a Christian, when you gave your life to the Lord, you did not board a cruise ship. You boarded a battleship. And look, the truth is this. You, we're all in a battle. Whether you walk with Jesus or not, we're all in a battle. It's just the only, the only difference is the outcome. If you're with Jesus... You are victorious. You are more than a conqueror. You are not fighting for victory. You're fighting from victory when you're with Jesus. But if you do not know Jesus tonight, you are on the loser's side, my friend. 
And I'm not talking about just in a, in, a, in a temporal game of this world. I'm talking about eternity. And it's very serious. But the Lord said to me, if you don't quit, I'll do what you can't do. So perseverance is your first key to your comeback. Now, look, when I heard that, man, look, I was immediately filled with hope, man, filled with joy because I knew I was going to win. Not only would I win, I was going to win by a knockout. Why did I know it would be a knockout? Because in all my experience, I've never seen God leave a decision up to the judges. <laughs> Process of elimination, right? I've never seen it happen, so it ain't going to happen. So look, I was like, man, I'm going to win by a knockout, you know? So I was like, Lord, here we go. I wanted it to come quick and easy, right? TV dinners and Netflix. And, man, we live in a spoiled, rotten, modern, Western culture. We want everything quick and easy, don't we? You know, 150 years ago, you had to start planning meals three days in advance. <laughs> now I just stick it in the microwave. 40 seconds later, you got a Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Whatever happened to the saying, nothing good comes easy, right? But I'm like, this, gonna, this victory, this knockout victory is going to come quick and easy. So I started looking for every punch to be the last one. I'm like, all right, Lord, come on. Come on. Let's just, uh, let's just do it through a little jab. It'll be miraculous. You'll get all the glory. Come on. <laughs> all right, Lord, I'll be reasonable. Let's just do it through a left hand. Come on. <laughs> And then I began to encourage the creator of the universe. Come on, Jesus. Come on. You can do it. <laughs> he spoke the universe into existence. You can do it, Jesus. Come on. You can do it. Come on. <laughs> In the fourth round, Courtney broke my jaw with a straight right hand. As the ramp fight progressed, my kidneys started hemorrhaging. I was internally bleeding. In the later rounds, my eyes began to swell shut. I could barely see, bleeding everywhere. After the 11th round, you know, I go back to my corner, and my corner starts praying for me right there. <laughs> <laughs> You ought to YouTube it, man. That fight's brutal. Watch the whole fight. It's, 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 it's crazy. But my corner says, Lord God, give him the strength to do whatever he has to do. <laughs> Go check it out. It's a trip. Look, the reason that prayer was made was because we had no idea what I had to do. Look, I thought I might have to die in the 12th round. I'll be resurrected from the dead on showtime. I'm not even joking. I was prepared to die on showtime. I, you know, Lord, give you the strength to do whatever he has to do. Look, we had no idea. Here, here's the point. We had no idea how the 12th round was going to go. I had no idea what God was going to do. No idea. And look, right now you're in the 11th round. You are in the 11th round, and you don't get to see what happens in the 12th, right? We don't get to see how God works it out. We don't get to see how God works a troubled marriage out. We don't see, get to see how God brings back that prodigal. We don't get to see how God delivers us from these, these things that have held us down that we thought we never had, could have freedom from. We don't get to see it. But I can tell you this, God will reward your commitment to him in the 11th round in the 12th. He will reward your commitment to him this week or this month, next month. He will reward your surrenderedness to him this year, next year. It's the principles of reaping and sowing. Note takers, you always reap what you sow, you always reap after you sow, and you always reap more than you sow. 
I had no idea what was going to happen in the 12th round, but I knew I couldn't quit. Guys, you are in the 11th round. If you don't quit, he'll do what you can't do. I, look, I know Satan is always looking for an opportune time to come against us. He always is. Now, look, if we, if we resist him, he'll flee. He's a wimp. Right? Jesus is the victory. And the victory is Jesus. We get to share in Jesus' victory. If we resist him, he'll flee. But he's always looking for an opportune time to come against us. And I bet there, I know, I, it's reality. There are many in here thinking, I got to throw in the towel, man. I got to throw in the towel on my marriage because it's, you know, I don't deserve to be treated like this. It ain't right, you know. It just ain't working out. We don't love each other anymore. Throw in the towel on an addiction. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm going back, man. Throw in the towel on an old lifestyle. I, I know the temptation is there, but look, if you don't quit, he will do what you can't do. But you got to make it to the 12th round. You got to make it to the 12th round. I go into the 12th round, halfway through it, Courtney hit me with a big right hand, and I was hurt bad. I fell back into the ropes. My instinct was just to fight, man, so I threw a left hand, and as I did, it was held back behind one of the ring ropes. <laughs> I encourage you to YouTube it. It's a trip. <laughs> it was held back, and, and at that moment, everything drained out of me, and I started to go down. The commentator was like, What's Ebo doing with his head down like that? I'm like, I'm thinking. <laughs> and at that moment, I knew I was about to get knocked out. I knew it. If I could even make it to my feet, I knew at that moment, Courtney was going to knock me out. I had done everything I could do, but I knew it was over. So I cried out to the Lord. Maybe that's where you're at right now. The only good thing to do is to cry out to God. I cried out to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm about to get knocked out. <laughs> it's about to be over. But Lord, I didn't quit. Lord, not only did I not quit, but I haven't thought about quitting since you made that promise to me in the second round. The second key to your comeback, perseverance is first. Second, perspective. I said, Lord, I haven't thought about quitting. You see, Jesus said to take your thoughts captive. Why would he say that? Proverbs 23, 7 gives more, 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 a little more to this subject. It says, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. See, the way we think will ultimately dictate who we become. Now, I don't think in my heart. I think with my mind. But as we think with our mind, as we dwell on thoughts, they take root in our heart. And the things that take root in our heart determine who we become. That's why many times through the Scriptures we're exhorted. The things that are noble and pure and trustworthy and righteous and these type of things, meditate on those. You know, we're, we're encouraged through the scriptures to meditate on the word of God. You know, the world says meditation's emptying your mind. The Bible says meditation's filling your mind. <laughs> I can't empty my mind. Have you ever tried? <laughs> Don't think about anything right now. Oh, you, just, yeah, come on. you know how it is. But I can fill my mind, can't I? We can all fill our minds. You know that. Here's the key. Fill it with truth. And everything that comes into your mind must be filtered through the word of God. Because if it's not true, if it's untrue, you need to take it captive. It's a military term in the Bible. When Jesus said, take your thoughts captive, it's like taking a, a prisoner of war. Take it captive. Wait, perspective is so important. We need a biblical perspective. Everything. Everything must be filtered through the Word of God. I'll use this example again because it's near and dear to my heart right now. But for those of you struggling in marriage, you know, you can list a number of reasons why your marriage is worth giving up on. But are any of them biblical? You go to the Word. 
The Bible commands the husband to love your wife as Christ has loved the church, selflessly, sacrificially, unconditionally. The Bible says that what, man is, what God has brought together, let no man separate. Filter everything through the word of God. Make sure your perspective is a biblical perspective. The second key to your comeback. Well, I said, Lord, I haven't thought about quitting. I'm not going to think about it. And I'm going to take that thought captive. I said, uh-uh, not going to do it. So I gathered together all the energy I could. All I had me, like I dug into reservoirs I didn't know existed. All I could do was just stand up. But when I got to my feet, something amazing happened. Listen, power came into my body. The commentator noticed it. If you watch that again on YouTube, he said, Ebo's got a, a burst of steam. Come on. <laughs> A burst of steam, I had, there was no burst of steam to be had. There was no steam. Come on. I, was, I had nothing left. What he thought was a burst of steam, God bless Steve Farhood. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's an interesting brother. I love him. But what he thought was a burst of steam was, in fact, the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It's the word dunamis. We get dynamite, dynamic from that word. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Listen, guys, your first key, perseverance. The second, perspective. The third, power. You want to make it to your comeback? You must have the power of the Holy Spirit. The greatest mistake the church often makes is that the church of God will try to do the work of God without the power of God. And it just doesn't work, guys. If we try to follow the Lord and be godly men and godly husbands and godly fathers and live life with integrity and purity and holiness, trying to do that in the flesh will not work. There's only one way to do it, and that is in the power of the Holy Spirit. Good news is this. God wants to give you the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not, a, it's not a trick. It's not a riddle. It's not maybe he will, maybe he won't. Ask and receive by faith. The same way you receive your salvation, you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you do that, check this out. You now have the power, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead in you. You telling me there's anything you can't overcome in Christ? Anything you can't find freedom from in Christ? Absolutely not. Because he, who's, he who the Son sets free is what? Free indeed. Amen. Amen. Are you guys as excited about that as me? <laughs> Amen. Perseverance, perspective, and power. So empowered by the Holy Spirit, my punches began to land with precision. 30 seconds later, the number four ranked fighter in the world was knocked out. And I was blown away, man. Blown away at the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, the generosity of God. And, and I couldn't hear the guys jeering me about praying for my opponent. I couldn't hear that, but God did. So I go over and I get on one knee and I pray for Courtney. I said this, I said, Lord, I pray you'll make this loss for him a benefit like you did for me three and a half years ago. That'll turn his whole life to you, knowing that nothing of this world satisfies, only a relationship with his creator. Guys, I stand here. I know Ronnie would stand here. I know Pastor Ted was in here and say to you, nothing of this world will ever satisfy. So please stop looking here. <laughs> right? There's only one way to find lasting fulfillment lasting meaning and purpose, and that's in Jesus Christ. Three keys to your comeback. Perseverance, perspective, and power. That fight was nominated for fight of the year, knockout of the year. Um, it was probably the greatest boxing comeback I ever had, but look, not the greatest comeback of my life by any means. 
I've got a good memory for a boxer. Uh, first, <laughs> it's true. You know, funny thing is, I told Ronnie, I said, dude, I used to race motocross, and the only sport I've ever been knocked out in is motocross. <laughs> Several times, for a long time. But um, first day of 10th grade, Mr. Sullivan's geometry class, trailer number three, sitting two rows over, five seats back. That's a good memory for a boxer, guys. Come on. A girl walks in class. I hadn't seen her since elementary school. We were friends in first through fourth grade. She comes in, sits down next to me, Amy White. We start talking. Soon after that, we started dating, dated all through high school, went to both proms together. Three weeks after high school graduation, we got married. Man, we had, the, we had it planned out. We had, the, we had it all planned out. Look, Amy's going to be a stay-at-home mom. I'm going to be a pro boxer. We're going to have tons of kids. We actually named all of our children in high school. <laughs> right? We were a little nuts. That's okay. You know? But we had a plan. The problem is we had both, we both knew the call of God in our lives. We recognized the call of God. Amy's dad's a Baptist pastor. I had been exposed to the gospel several times. We knew God had a plan for our lives. But we, instead of yielding to God, we resisted God. And you know what we did? We justified sin. See, I like what Ronnie said. Ronnie said, look, when, when I saw, read that word repent, I was convicted. And I said, I got to change my life. You know, me and Amy, we had a different story. We kind of grew up exposed to the gospel. We heard repent. We said, ah, uh, it makes sense for us. See, that's, that's the thing. Sin you can justify sin if you don't use the word of God to filter your life. You can always justify sin. You can always make it make sense with a natural mind. And that's what we did. We justified sin. We did what we wanted to do. We did what made sense to us, what was right in our own eyes. And what that did is it opened the door for the enemy to come in. The Bible gives Satan one job description, to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's three. I realize that right now. So, <laughs> but you get the point, okay? <laughs> you get the point. Look, seriously, guys, look. Satan has one job description, or three. To kill, to steal, to destroy. Listen, when we justified sin, it opened the door and he got in our relationship. When we got married, man, we had a target on our backs. Because Satan hates marriage. He hates it. And, and in no time, our beautiful friendship, the love we had for each other, in no time, it became very painful, confusing, frustrating. I don't know how we made it as long as we did, but at a year and a half, Amy filed for divorce. She just said, look, I, I love you, but I, I can't live like this anymore. We were both just, just wrecked and miserable. And we couldn't put a finger on why. And that's why we know it was spiritual. I remember when that happened. Immediately, I saw a void in my life. I'd never seen it before. It's like an emptiness, a, Pascal spoke of this. A French philosopher in the 1600s said, every human being has a God-shaped void in their hearts. And I saw that void for the first time. But instead of going to Jesus to fill the void in my life and to, to fill me to overflowing, I went into the world. I began using drugs, cocaine, meth, and ecstasy and abusing alcohol. And I thought a party lifestyle and women could satisfy but the more I went into that life, you know, I even thought, you know, accomplishment, success in boxing, money, I thought it could all satisfy. But the more I went after that, the bigger the void became, the more empty I became. Two years into our divorce one night, um, I sat down. I got down on my living room floor. I'd reached the end of my rope. And that's a great place to be. 
if you turn to Jesus. Being spiritually poor, spiritually broken. It's a great place to be. That's where I was at. I got on my knees in my living room and I cried out. I said, I got to find Amy. <laughs> I thought another human being could complete me. Your wife can compliment you, but don't ever expect her to complete you. If, uh, Colossians 2.10 says that we are complete in Christ. I found out where Amy was at. I went to her friend's house, knocked on Katie's door. Katie comes to the door. I beg with her. You got to get Amy. I need to talk to her again. I need to hear her voice. I need to hold her hand. You got to get Amy. She, get, she went and talked to Amy. She comes back. She says, Amy never wants to see you again, man. Lee, get out of here. She said to get out of her life. Leave her alone. I drove home, man. I got home. I sat on the side of my bed. And I began thinking about my life. Look, all my friends thought I had the, the perfect life. I, had, I was 20 years old. I had 60 grand in the bank. A number two world ranking as an amateur boxer. I had a brand new truck, brand new sports car, brand new house. 20 years old. But I hated my life. I began to think about the dreams I had of being a boxing champion. I knew I would never fight again. I didn't have it in me. I began to think about the marriage I dreamed of, a happy, fruit-bearing, loving marriage. I began to think about the kids we picked out names for in high school, and I knew at that moment those kids would never exist. They were just a dream. So I reached in the nightstand. I, was, I just reached this place of complete hopelessness. Struggled with depression most of my life, and I, this was just the the deepest valley I had been yet. And I reached the nightstand, pulled out a 40 caliber pistol and I put it to my head. And I remember sitting there on the bed and, and, I, and I just came to a resolute conclusion. I was ready to die. And I started to pull the trigger and as I started to pull it, I heard a still small voice that said, Ebo, if you don't quit, I'll do what you can't do. He said, if you, if you don't quit, if you'll just turn to me, if you'll surrender your life to me, I'll repair all that you've lost. I'll repair all that the, the locust has destroyed, and I'll bless you more than you could ever imagine. And right at that moment, hope came back. I put the gun down. And that night I began making, taking steps towards Jesus. I wish I could tell you immediately I was radically changed and I never looked back. I wish I could say that. But I started taking steps. That's what I did, man. I started taking a step. And that's what I encourage you in tonight. What's your next step to get closer to Jesus? Because I can promise you none of us have got there yet, right? None of us have apprehended. Paul said it. We haven't got there. So every one of us have another step to take. I know what mine is. Ronnie's message convicted me and convinced me of what my next step is. What's your next step? Take it. And then when you take that one, take the next one. That's what I began doing. Pretty soon I, I realized I was walking with God. And God began to work in my life. He, he put me back into boxing, took me to a number five world ranking. Yeah, you beat the number four guy that make you five. I don't know how it works, but anyway, you do the math. <laughs> you do the math, you know. <laughs> number five world ranking, gave me three championship belts, put me on a reality show in 2006 called The Contender in January 2007, calls me out of boxing and puts me into a, a life of Bible teaching and evangelism. The Lord's ways are not my ways. They are much, much higher. Soon after that, the, uh, the Lord began working on Amy's heart. That girl that had lost hope, just like I had, she came back into my life. I'm happy to tell you guys, we uh, 
in April, we celebrated 18 years remarried. <laughs> oh, oh, and by the way, those kids we had names picked out for, we got them. We got Maddie, Abby, Gabby, and Addie. <laughs> Maddie, Abby, Gabby, Addie. That's right. <laughs> I'm going to end with this, guys. Look, there are great comebacks in sports, great comebacks in the, the, the corporate world. There are, there are all kind of great comebacks. The greatest comeback you could ever have is coming back to Jesus. The greatest comeback you could ever have is taking a step towards Jesus. Jesus. 